Hi, my name is Fred Logavon and I teach at Cornell University. I'm in the History Department there. I'm also currently serving as the Vice Provost for International Affairs at Cornell and as the Director of the Mario Inouye Center for International Studies. Well, the, the process by which the United States became uh, involved in Vietnam is a lengthy one. I try to show in my new book, Embers of War, that it began really uh, in support uh, of the French War effort. A conviction, I think, um, developed on the part of American officials that you needed France to prevail in Indochina, largely, I think, for Cold War reasons, that if Indochina were lost, then it would be a serious blow to U.S. security, uh, it would be a, a major defeat in the emerging Cold War, and so little by little we see the United States, not through any particular decision, but a series of decisions becoming involved, supporting the French, ultimately I think being more committed to the French war than were the French themselves. And then once the French are defeated, um, basically choosing to try to succeed where the French had failed, which is to prevent all of Vietnam from becoming uh, communist. One of, the, one of the striking findings in my research for, the, for Emerson War was the degree to which Ho Chi Minh believed that ultimately the United States would be his ally in his cause, in his, in his fight for Vietnamese independence. We could say he was naive, that this was something that he really should never have imagined, but the fact is that he did. I would say from 1919, when he tried to get an audience with Woodrow Wilson at the Versailles Peace Conference, failed. All the way through, I would say, the late 1940s, so we're talking 1947, 1948, he believed throughout that period that the United States, which had been born out of an anti-colonial reaction itself, would again be there for him. And I think, yes, one can imagine a different relationship um, resulting, which is not to say, I think, that he would have been an ally of the United States or would have been pro-American or um, would have become somehow anti-communist. I believe that he was convinced that Marxism, Leninism represented the best path of development for his country. That it was always his country. And I do think that one could have, one can imagine uh, a different relationship than the one that resulted. It's hard to know whether he believed that the Marxism was on some level instrumental. Um, I think he was quite convinced that it was the best path for Vietnam going forward. He also said, however, in part to, I think, disarm French and American uh, interlocutors, that it'll be a long time before Vietnam is fully communist. It might not ever happen. Um, and I do think there was a certain instrumentalist um, uh, core in his, in his beliefs here. I don't think all historians would, would agree with me on that. But I think he was ultimately a pragmatist. He was quite flexible, it seems to me, as a, as a, as a thinker. And over time, we might have seen that even on, with respect to this particular question. Well, the, the, the other figure in the Vietnamese leadership that I think, especially during the French War, is of, of critical, important, uh, critical importance is General Zap, who did indeed just die very recently. Um, uh, I suggest in Embers of War that only Ho Chi Minh himself was ulti ultimately more important to the success of the revolution than, than Zap. So Zap, I think, matters because he fought first the French, who were superior to him in military uh, terms, by almost all measures, and defeated the French. He then fought the Americans, and at the very least uh, battled them to a standstill. Um, and I think for those reasons, must rank as an extremely important figure in, in, in the success of the revolution. Both of these gentlemen, interestingly enough, Ho and Zhao, I think in the later internal um, infighting in the North Vietnamese leadership, in Hanoi's leadership, both of them I think were on the, on the moderate side of the spectrum, uh, were on the more pragmatic side of the spectrum, and they had a number of important figures, notably Lei Zuan, um, who were uh, more doctrinaire, I think, uh, more hardline, 
and ultimately they were, both of them to some extent, marginalized as a result. But in the French War, and even in the aftermath, the immediate af aftermath of that French War, I would say that it's Ho and Zap who matter the most. You know, I think it, uh, appeasement um, and the so-called Munich analogy um, it's a really interesting part of this story. I don't think there's any question that U.S. officials, really beginning already in the Truman years, um, but I think building more steadily up through at least the early 1960s, um, believed that in domestic political terms in particular, they would pay a very heavy price indeed if they were perceived as appeasers, if they were perceived as uh, uh, negotiating away uh, anything of significance to communist adversaries. And I think democratic administrations, so here I mean Kennedy and Johnson, um, to some extent Truman earlier as well, especially after the so-called fall of China in 49, I think they felt it especially acutely. I think Democrats were especially vulnerable to charges of softness on communism. Republicans, I think, were very good throughout the Cold War and indeed beyond um, in terms of a, uh, then a kind of softness on, on terrorism. Democrats felt especially vulnerable to these charges, and I don't think there's any question, at least in my mind, that it actually had an important effect on policy. And indeed, one could go as far as to suggest that it helps to explain um, the initial serious commitment to, to the French cause in Indochina, and then ultimately what we call today in the, the Americanization of the war in the first half of the 1960s. I think one of the things that is a, a, an interesting feature of U.S. policy in the Cold War is the disinclination, especially in the first half of the Cold War, to, on the part of US, senior U.S. officials, to negotiating with communist adversaries. Obviously, throughout the period, there are lots of negotiations with allies, and in some cases with uh, neutral uh, countries, uh, non-aligned countries. But with communist uh, governments, there is a, a deep skepticism, even an aversion, I would say, to doing so. What we see happen over time is that that begins to change. First, I would say, in a meaningful way under John F. Kennedy in the final year of his life, building then to some extent uh, under Johnson in the years that followed, though not really over Vietnam. Uh, but in a more substantial way with the advent of uh, the Kissinger administration, Richard Kissinger and Henry Kissinger, showing a willingness that I don't think was there, at least to that extent before, to actually bargaining potentially with the dreaded uh, communists. And I think that's a very important development, which I don't think we see in those critical early years of the Cold War. Partly, I would say, for domestic political reasons. That is to say, I think that behind closed doors, there is a willingness to at least contemplate, for example, on the part of John Foster Dulles and others, um, uh, engaging in serious negotiations. That is to say, something other than negotiating the, the modalities of, of, of Moscow's surrender. Serious negotiations, but an unwillingness to really do it uh, in reality, I think in part because of the fear that you'll pay a domestic political price if you do so. There are a couple of lessons that we can take, uh, at least a couple that I'll mention here, uh, lessons that we can take from the Vietnam experience for present day policymakers. One I think would be that what we see on display in Vietnam, first with respect to the French war and then the, uh, the American war, is the limits of power. That you can be superior to your adversary. Uh, in terms of the means, the military means at your disposal. And it will not be enough, uh, because all wars are ultimately won politically, if they're going to be won at all. And so I think one of the things we see here is that um, what you really need to have is political support on the ground in the country in question, whether it's Vietnam or anywhere else, um, or all the, all the firepower in the world is not going to be sufficient. So that's one lesson I would take away from this. A second, it seems to me, is that uh, 
negotiations have utility. Uh, that in fact what we see uh, in Vietnam and that I think can be applied to is that in a way the essence of diplomacy is the willingness to, to, to bargain uh, with not just allies but with adversaries without fear it doesn't mean uh, appeasement in that pejorative sense it doesn't mean giving away the store but going in uh, with, a, with, a, with a clear indication uh, that negotiations can have utility, can be a way to solve serious international problems, and goodness knows that the Vietnam case is a prime example. Even then, it will take often a long time to bear fruit. Certainly, the, the Vietnam negotiations, when they began, um, it, was a, it was a tough road. But I, I, I do take away from this um, Maybe in a, in a way more in, in, a, in the negative sense from the French war, but really from both the French war and the American war, uh, a inclination on the part of French authorities and then American authorities to negotiate, and everybody involved paid a very, very heavy price as a result, not least, in fact, most of all, the Vietnamese.